Hello and welcome to my channel, the home of Quality Land. Okay, actually it's not the home of Quality Land, it's the home of me, but we are all somewhat a part of this world called Quality Land. Quality Land is a satirical story that exaggerates the truth of our reality so that we can view it a little bit more objectively and see just how ridiculous our reality is and the path that we are heading if we continue making our reality the way that our reality is. So without further ado, let's go ahead and talk about this book. I'm gonna do a little reviewing. I'm gonna do a short little review for those of you who haven't read it to make you excited to read it. And the second half of the video is gonna be me talking about my philosophical takeaway from this book. My name is Michelle and I am from the channel Heart of Michi where I just post my reviews without thinking about it. Here you go, here's my thoughts on a book. So if you're interested in that and you wanna hear more of my points of view, go ahead and like and subscribe before we get going. With that being said, let's go ahead and get going. to this story and see these characters as somewhat superficial. They're realistic, yes, but also it's a comedy, it's a satire, so the characters are only going to get so deep because the point of the story is not necessarily to look into the characters so much as use the characters as a frame of reference to view the world. So these characters serve more of a purpose for their point of view than they do for their emotional reactions to everything, although there are emotional reactions, let's not get me wrong. But if I were to give the characters a scale of one to 10 quality, I'd say it's a seven. I'd say that these characters are well above average. Some of them are really, really interesting. However, they're not like Brandon Sanderson level or anything crazy like that. They're not Murakami level. They are just really solid characters who play their part in the story very well. The main character, I think his name is Joe Jobless. Nope. John Jobless? Hold on. Peter. So the main character's name is Peter Jobless. He is part of the lowest part of society, and his last name is based off the job of his father, who was jobless. And this guy works as a machine breaker downer. There's a word for it. He basically puts machines in those in those little compression compartments that like basically squishes them down. You know how like in Wally, he like pulls things into his stomach, he squishes them and he poops them out. It's kind of like that, but like a big machine. There's a word for it. Machine press, something like that. Anyway, that's his job, but he, uh, he doesn't, he doesn't kill the robots. He can't, he doesn't want to kill the robots. So he, uh, he has like a ragtag group of robots with him, which is just, they're so hilarious. Each one of them is so unique. Pink, gotta be one of my favorite. That girl just has so much attitude. Okay, she's a robot. She's actually like an iPad, basically. She has so much personality. I love her character so much. And she kind of like pairs off with this other guy whose joke is kaput. Every time the narrator yells from that guy's point of view, I die. It is so hilarious. Let me see if I can actually find the real word. He yells every single time. Transformers more than meets the eye. Gotta be somewhere here. I don't know. I can't find it. I'll find it. I'll find it eventually. They are just adorable. Each one of them has their own little quirks and their own little personalities, and it's fantastic. Then there is another character who is John of the People. He's basically an AI who was created for the specific purpose of becoming president of Quality Land, and he's going against a very right-wing conservative, freedom of the people kind of guy. They have their little like tiff. Um, there's a whole plot line with that. And then we have one other character. Um, I just saw his name. It's like Martin or something. Oh, it is Kaput. Yeah, Martin. And then we have another character named Martin. And these three characters help us get Peter Jobless, the lowest of the low, the most um, low class point of view. So like the lowest down, down to the earth point of view of this world. Then we have Martin, who's a middle class guy, and we get to see his perspective of the world. And then we get to see this AI who is trying to be president. So he's on the very top of the world. So between these three perspectives and the side characters, we get to start building a point of reference for how this world works and we get to fully explore the society of it. The characters, although they are not necessarily the most amazing characters, they are one, funny, two, interesting, three, unique, and four, hilarious. Kaput!
The plot of this book is great. All three of these plot lines kind of weave together eventually. I would say that the plot is really good. I actually would say the plot is like an eight or nine out of 10. It's not like there's a bunch of twists and turns that are really gonna like blow you back from the water. But again, the point of this book is not as much the plot as it is the themes. Scott from Book Invasion, who you should definitely subscribe to, especially if you like sci-fi, especially if you like funny sci-fi. Scott from Book Invasion, which I will link down below, he gave me an audiobook of Quality Land. He did a really good job explaining and giving you a good introduction to what the book is going to be about. So I'm going to link that up in the corner and highly recommend you guys check it out because it's probably going to be better than mine. Mine's a lot more subjective. His is a really good overview of the story as a whole and I think it's really good for making you excited about reading it so check it out. What are the themes we're going to be discussing? Well, quality and society using AI and algorithms and big business to run our society. And this is happening right now. Like, yes, this book is an exaggeration. Yes, this book is a joke. But what is happening in this book is legitimately happening right now. In this book, we have algorithms that determine both a person's place in society, who they meet in society, who they get to interact with, what kind of ads they see, what kind of movies they see, and that kind of stuff. And these algorithms determine a person's place within the society. And there's a sort of like leveling up system where you could work yourself up into a new level. But that system's kind of broken because we see for Peter Jobless that the more the book progresses, the lower in level the poor guy gets. And it is really tough to watch because he gets put into a category that is the lowest of the low within society where he matches his name. He's Peter Jobless. He's part of the lowest part of society. And even though he has a job, he doesn't have a girlfriend and he doesn't have many prospects for his life as a machine breaker downer who doesn't even, you know, compress the machines, whatever that job is called. You guys just I'm sorry. All the while we have the president, well, he's trying to be president and he's a robot. His purpose is to make life better for humans. He wants to make things more effective, make things better for all humans. And yet no one likes him. Why would they want him when they could just have freedom and the ability to have jobs, jobs that give them purpose in their life? You know, like working in the coal mines or working in the factories, these jobs, give meaning to life. And this robot's trying to take it away. He's trying to take away jobs. He's trying to make life better for everyone, which nobody really wants. Nobody wants him because he's so logical and so direct and so to the point because he's a robot. He doesn't have the emotional connection. He can't play the game and people don't like him. As this book progresses, John is given a pink dildo, a pink dolphin dildo. And the question then becomes, how the heck did this guy get given a pink dolphin dildo? And so the whole book is us trying to find out, well, at least all of the chapters from Peter's perspective are about us trying to find out how the heck he got the dolphin dildo and how that relates to the world's bigger problems. Like this small little problem, the small little dolphin dildo that this guy wants nothing to do with, it highlights a problem within the greater world. It's a small problem. It's something he could have just thrown away. He could have just thrown it away, moved on with his life, but he didn't. He got obsessed with why he got this pink dildo. He wants to return it. Not ex It's not getting accepted. They say they can't accept it as a return because he wants it. He wants it. The algorithms prove that he wants it and he can't give back or return something that he wants. This book is so tied to the concept of algorithms and how they affect our everyday lives life. They're little things that we have signed away. We've signed those terms of agreement. We've said yes. We've said okay to these companies taking our information, using that to create a profile for us. And that profile determines what we see. And in this book, we get to see what would happen if that was on blast. If that little thing that we sometimes complain about nowadays, you know, you talk about pregnancy and then on your Instagram, you start seeing birth control stuff or baby stuff. Imagine you can never get away from it. Imagine that those algorithms determine your place in life. 
What if those algorithms are actually holding you back because the machine is just feeding you back things that you have already seen? And you might argue, oh no, but I can choose to go to other areas. I can choose to see other things. Well, your search results are limited as well. And what you see is limited because of your profile, because of the other things that you've searched. Everything that you've searched adds to your profile. Everything that you've looked up, everything that you've interacted with adds to your profile to create this algorithmic version of you that will then be used to feed you things that you're going to want, things that you're going to want to buy, things that you're going to want to watch, things that you're going to want to consume. They are given to you based on your profile. And the whole takeaway I got from this book was... What is my profile? How consciously am I choosing my profile? Are algorithms really helping us or are they stagnating us? Is there a way to improve the algorithms? Is there a way to prevent this inevitable outcome where things are not allowed to be repaired because the whole need of society is to buy things? A hundred years ago, furniture was made to last a hundred years. Now, furniture is made to last five to 10 years so that you're forced to buy it again, so that you're forced to spend more money on this product because these products are intentionally made poorly to make you buy more in this world, just take that concept to the extreme. They're not allowed to repair. If something's broken, you throw it away, you get a new one. That includes robots. That includes conscious beings who have personalities and experiences that are unique to them. And so another question becomes, you know, there's this sort of philosophical question of at what point does a robot become a consciousness that should be taken seriously as a human? And that's something we need to start thinking about as a society. Robots are becoming more and more likely as an outcome. This algorithm world is becoming more and more likely as we continue to give all our money to Amazon. And because of this book and because of some of the conversations I've had with you guys on Instagram and, and Discord about algorithms and about Amazon, I'm starting to wonder if Amazon is not incredibly dangerous the way that it works because of the fact it monopolizes. It becomes the store. So the, in the book, there is this thing called the store and the store is where you buy everything. There's this whole plot line about how these digital markets actually reduce competition and make it harder for individuals to come out or for new things to happen. And it cements us further and further into these ways, which is really frightening if you ask me, because we should never get stuck in a place like that, a wasteful, terrible place like that, where you're stuck with, with your lot in society and you're stuck with your situation and you're stuck in a world where Earth is not prioritized. Earth is not something that people care about. Taking care of the planet, the home that we live on is not important because what's important is money. And is that really that far off from our reality? Is this future society at some unknown period in time, which seems roughly 50 maybe years in the future, if even that far, is that impossible? I don't think so. And that's what's scary to me is that this is incredibly <laughs> possible. And from reading this book, I have had some significant moments of crying and depression because of this book. So yeah, you might feel the same way. But for me, it's important because I needed to have these strong emotional reactions to the philosophy so that I could start to consider my own purchasing power. Am I going to just let the algorithms keep me in the place where I'm going to be stuck? Am I just going to let myself become part of this machine, part of this unstoppable force that is propelling humanity forward, but also stagnating humanity and furthering the divide between the powerful and the not powerful? Is that what we want for our world? Because it is not what I want for my world. I don't want this to happen. I really, really, really don't want this to happen. But this is our reality. It's an exaggeration, but this is our reality. And that freaks the hell out of me. That scares the absolute shit out of me. And I don't want it to happen. So yes, I am obsessed with this book. Yes, I do feel like this book is phenomenal. May other people find it as phenomenal? No, especially if you don't want to be depressed about society. But I think this is a book that everyone should read because you need to consider these things about our society. These things cannot be ignored. And I know some of you read to escape. I know that many of you read so that you can escape the world because the world is shitty. We all know that. But 
You can't hide from something forever. You can't hide from the inevitability of humanity. And if you choose to take a sideline on this, on this, on the world, if you choose to sit in the sideline, you are one of these people ruled by the algorithm. You are one of these people who the world is telling you what to think and feel and eat and watch and see and to contain and buy. The world is telling you, not you. And that world is made by people who have selfish goals of making a lot of money. How are we going to get out of this? I don't know. But I think books like these are what starts the conversation. So I ask you right now, what do you think we could do consciously on an individual level to prevent this future from coming? And what can we do on a sociological level, on a society level, to prevent this outcome from happening? Because to be honest, it is not far off. And if we continue the path we're going, this is going to happen. It is not a question of if, it is a question of when. And I I, quite frankly, want to avoid that crap. So join me in the discussion on how the heck we're going to save the world from quality land. I don't, I don't know what that was. That was me trying to be intense. I don't know. I was already on a rampage. So thank you so much for sticking through with this entire video where I really laid it in on the philosophical aspect of this because this is a book that has been, I have been thinking about it since I read it. I have not stopped thinking about it. I have read other books and perhaps that's part of why I feel like Mistborn's a little bit more superficial because I don't think Mistborn is impacting society and I don't think Mistborn has the ability to impact society in the same way that society might be impacted if they all read this book. <laughs> So to me, I feel like this is a more quality book than other, than other books, including Mistborn. That's my opinion. That's my personal perspective. You might, not, you might disagree. You might not want anything to do with this book. This book might scare you, and it should. It should scare you because this is our future. Anyway, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm going to hop off that soapbox and just say thank you so much for watching. If you like this video and you like this discussion, definitely like and subscribe for more of them to come. And please put your thoughts down below whether you've read it or whether or not you would ever even consider reading it. I'd be very interested to know. And while you're at it, I just want to say have a beautiful, amazing, fantastic day. Bye.